So he wants me to dig into a couple things related to some of the stories we worked on. Um, and the first question is this notion of middlemen. Uh, so we wrote a story on the University of Alabama and a couple other schools in the SEC, and they had a business manager who was acting as go-between between agents and players. How prevalent is that? Uh, for those of you that have ex experienced it already, you, you might say it's extremely prevalent. For those of you who have not dealt with it, you will at some point uh, if you're having success in landing meetings, etc. And it's real simple. There's so much money, at least it's perceived to be so much money at the top, that anywhere somebody can fit their way into a prospect's life, they're going to do so. And then, so one of the hardest things for you guys to do as agents, those of you that are, is to identify who in the process actually has sway with this kid. Who is it that you can get to that actually has his kid's ear? Is the kid himself? Is it his mother? Is it his buddy who's his business manager? Etc. And that can be, uh, if any of you guys watched House of Cards, uh, I've been watching that a lot. It's very similar to that. It's, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors and it can be maddening uh, in that regard. So uh, the next question he had for me is, is the modern compliance office equipped to deal with the demands of policing recruiting of top student athletes? So I think we can all laugh at that a little bit. It's, uh, you know, they're flying blind. And a lot of times what I find interesting in this industry is people want to be given credence because they've got a title. The reality is a lot of people, most people at least that I dealt with in compliance offices, didn't know anything. Not only that, they didn't care. Uh, I'll give you one example. When I was running the company that Neil told, told you about earlier, basically the idea was, okay, everyone tells us kids go bankrupt at a crazy rate. Whether you dispute the number, 78% within a few years of leaving the league or not, is irrelevant. Let's say it's a lot of them. Regular society, it's 1% of the actual populace that goes bankrupt in a given year or declares bankruptcy less than. In the athlete field, obviously, it's a lot more. They find themselves in financial distress. So the question is, are they genetically predisposed to going broke or finding themselves in financial distress? Or is there something more there, right? And it was real simple. It's something more there. They're not being educated. As you guys know, dealing with the business, oftentimes these kids come from the lower rung of the socioeconomic ladder. So when I grew up uh, on, the, on the wrong side of the tracks, if you will, there were no lawyers, doctors, you know, individuals, CPAs. That, that didn't exist in the neighborhood. Everyone was blue collar. So who was going to teach me if I could jump 40 inches and run a 4-3 and had an opportunity to play in the league? Who's going to teach me how to deal with that process? How do I hire a CPA? How do I hire an attorney? How do I hire uh, an agent, etc.? So I wanted to help these kids vet their prospects. I said, there's a hole in the system. They're crossing this bridge. There's a big hole in there. And I wanted to fill it. So in talking to one of these schools, and I talked to every top 25 school out there a lot. It was very persistent. One of the guys made a mistake of responding to me. I'd sent him a, an uh, outside the lines piece called Million Dollar Mistakes. And it was Kenny Anderson and uh, Antoine Walker, I don't know if you guys remember, discussing how they went broke. And I thought it was really sad. Granted, Antoine Walker was buying fur coats and Bentleys and things that make it hard to feel bad for a guy. But again, you go back to the education. Did he really understand the gravity of what it was that he was doing? I don't think he did. So I sent it to this guy, and for me, it, it makes me feel something like, man, I wish you know, something had been done, something could have been done better, because as these men, these young men, mature into grown men, as you see with Walker and Anderson, they have a little bit of perspective. They can look back and say, wow, these were some mistakes that I made, I won't make those again. By the time they get to the end of the road and they're broke, there is no going back, it's over. So they're not going to get another bite at the apple. So anyway, I send this to this guy, at the, all you can say is, well, University of Oklahoma. And it was a compliance director who had been talking to me and said he cared the whole time. And he replied to my message, but he clearly did not mean to, and I'll tell you why. But his response to me sending him that email was, box of Kleenex, question mark. And I was flabbergasted because, you know, it's even if you think these guys are idiots or ignorant or whatever, they're human beings. And they're going through something that's clearly difficult. And I think... Most of you in this room got into this business because you want to do good. You want to help these young men. You want to help them do better. And there is a lot of altruism in that realm. Obviously, people are aware it can be lucrative as well. But if you've lasted in the business for three or four years or more, it's not about money. It's got to be about something more. And, uh, and that, that really opened up my eyes at that point. I said, you know, I'm out of here. I'm not going to deal with this anymore. Um, which was great because now I'm freed up to talk about how incompetent they all are. And they are incompetent, you know, across the board. Uh, you deal with people that are smart in the compliance world, but they don't have juice. So they're very intelligent. They know what's wrong with the system. They'll tell me back channel what's wrong with the system. They will not tell their bosses. They don't want to lose their job. It's cushy. And maybe someday they'll be an assistant AD. They can go play golf in the middle of the day, make $220,000 a year. Everything's great. You go to football games, take pictures on Instagram. They love their jobs. You know, none of them, though, when it comes down to it, when you say, you know, let's take the University of North Carolina, they're vetting agents for their players. Why? The guy in charge of that program has no more experience than 
actually has far less experience than anybody in this room dealing with agents. I've heard he's a nice guy. I'm not taking aim at him personally, but I've spoken to a number of agents who felt like the system failed them. Well, what happens then? The agents stop going through the front door. They start going through the side door. And all of you have experienced that. If, if the rules are not enforced, what incentive is there to follow the rules? I like driving fast. Whenever I get on the open road and I see people going 90, I'm going 95. I want to, to make sure that I am not, in that instance, you know, if people are going somewhere and they're trying to get there in 90, I want to get there as well so I can become productive. I'm going to do everything I can to go that route. To me, it's the same thing in the agent world. I see a race to the bottom in a lot of the, especially in the upper echelons, in terms of behavior that we all know is questionable, right? And then for people that are young in their, in their careers, you can kind of, I think a lot of you guys probably follow the rules pretty closely. And then you find out, and I've had conversations with younger agents who say this, you know, as you find out that these rules are being broken, it starts making you question, well, why am I following these rules? And that's a, that's a problem in the industry. Compliance folks add into that because if they want you to start paying attention to them while they're, while they're at the helm and calls, they want you to go through the front door. If they don't return your phone calls, if they don't set up the meetings for you like they said they would, and if they ignore you and treat you as if you don't matter, eventually they're going to stop answering, uh, answering to them. All right, so the next one was, uh, <clears throat> what's your perception on the connection between top sports media and the top echelon of agents? Is there a quid pro quo at work? at the highest levels? Uh, fantastic question. Absolutely, there's a quid pro quo. Uh, you can pay very close attention. Uh, there was a gentleman who runs a uh, well-known, uh, what used to be independent site, uh, who had taken a couple shots at me during the course of my reporting on some other things. Uh, I found that to be very interesting, so I dug into his connection to a, an agent in particular that I figured he probably had a relationship with. Lo and behold, a massive number of the stories that he's broken on his website came directly from this agent or his staff. It was over 120 in a two-year period. This particular guy has a page hits, bit, uh, page hits, page, I'm sorry, page views bonus in his contractor, so I've been told. Uh, and so he actually makes money based on how many people go to his website. Well, that is the definition of a quid pro quo. You are actually sending him news on big name players I'll, I'll stay away from divulging names of players. I'm sure you can all put it two and two together. But these players are people that, um, in our world, it's about clicks. Can you write something that people click on? So if he gets 120 stories on players that guys are going to click on, that's traffic to his site, exposure, and, and ultimately money in his pocket if he hits his benchmarks. Well, what's the return for that agent? This is anecdotal evidence because obviously I've not had anybody admit it to me, but you certainly never see anything that could be construed as negative on this guy's site about this particular agent. And, uh, you know, is that ethical in our world? It depends on what you are. If you are a, uh, an entertainment reporter, there are no ethics. Do what you want. And there are a lot of entertainment reporters in our field. When I got into it, I took it really seriously. The reason I got into this business was because, <clears throat> largely my experiences that Neil told you about there and what I went into a second ago with the uh, service I tried to start. These people wouldn't change because it was the right thing to do. And so I was really frustrated because I, I knew that I could help here. I wanted to help. I was doing it for dirt cheap. I had a law degree from a great school. I could have been making $200,000 a year instead. I'm spending the last of my savings to try and do something that I thought was good uh, for these young men, ultimately hoping that they come back to their communities later on in life and do good. And that's a story for another day why I care about that. But long story short, I recognize that if you tell the truth about these people enough times, in an open forum and force them to face the truth, sunshine can be a very powerful disinfectant. And so that's really what I focused on in this regard. So me, I, I fashion myself a capital J journalist. You can't buy me, I'm not selling my integrity. If I catch you doing something that leads players to be stolen from or, you, or stealing from them yourself, I'm gonna write that. I don't care who you are, how many times we've said hey to each other, how many times I've called you brother, bro, any other term of endearment. I like a lot of people in this business and if I find out you're stealing from players, I'll write it because there, most people in this business won't do it. And I just don't think it's, it's right. I don't think it's right to protect people uh, in our world if you're gonna call yourself a journalist um, if you're not disclosing your relationship. To those folks. Anyway, that's one example. There are a million others. I'm happy to share other stories with you guys offline. Um, <laughs> uh, based on what you've seen, her, and I might need a security detail. <laughs> uh, based on what you've seen, heard, and learned, what is the relationship between top coaches and top agents? If you follow me on Twitter, uh, I'm, I'm, I'd love to discuss this in a public forum. I hope that people can pick up the breadcrumbs. Unfortunately, as an investigative journalist, I can't publish everything. Uh, I know it's true. I'm almost positive it's true, but I can't prove it. I don't have a video, I don't have a piece of 
documentary evidence. I don't have three sources who were in the room when the deal was made, etc. But I can assure you, there are coaches out there right now receiving money from agents. Whether it's money direct to their pocket, whether it's reductions in their fees, whatever the financial arrangement is, coaches are absolutely receiving financial benefits from agents in order to deliver players to them. Now, there are other, uh, there are other setups that make you uh, ask questions. So I'm going to walk through one without uh, drawing any fault here. We're just going to go through and, and deal with what's out in the public. Pete Thamel wrote an article uh, a couple months ago now on Jimmy Sexton. I don't know how many of you guys read that one. Um, it was very fascinating, and it didn't draw any conclusions, but it basically said, hey, you know, some people have a problem with Jimmy being able to represent uh, head coaches and then also players. Uh, this is an issue that I think uh, is vastly undercovered, and I hope that people get into it and, and realize why it's important. But you go through the quotes, all right? So you had, quote one was, uh, I believe it was Houston Nutt. No, I'm sorry. Quote one was uh, uh, Lane Kiffin. I'm going to do this backwards. Anyway, Lane Kiffin says, uh, Coach one says, oh, does he recruit our, more, I'm sorry, uh, Malzahn. Malzahn says, does he come to our uh, campus and recruit our kids? Yes, but no pressure, one way or the other. But we think it's great that he recruits me. Yeah, that's one. Two, Lane Kiffin. Yeah, I told Matt Barkley to go to him. Uh, I thought he was a great agent and told Matt to go that way. Okay, well, Jimmy represents Lane. Lane may not necessarily be the best person to advise Matt on who to choose. We got that, okay. Three was, um, maybe that was anyway, we cut out three. So four was uh, uh, Houston then. Yeah, you know, Jimmy's been working with me for 15 years for free. And uh, my wife said, you know, to send him some cookies because, geez, you know, we've been working for so long. And there may be absolutely nothing there, right? Absolutely nothing, and I certainly don't have any proof. But when you look at the number of Jimmy Sexton clients that end up going with him from, uh, that sign him with him from schools where he's got head coaches in tow, Alabama, for instance, he kills it in the first and second round over there. Uh, other schools, he kills it in the top rounds. And so it just makes you question, okay, if there's no financial arrangement, why in the world are these coaches pushing their players so hard to go to these guys? And I can disclose this much. I've spoken to players from these schools. I've got some on the record. Some not, and they do feel pushed. I mean, very, very hard. This is not a secret, uh, and it's something I've been working on for a while, but frankly, I've not been able to get enough players on the record to write the story. But at the very least, it creates an ethical quandary. If you are represented by an agent, and you are aggressively pushing said agent upon a player, and something goes wrong, should there be some kind of a buffer between that player and that coach and the influence that they have my answer would be yes, and if nothing else, it's to eradicate the appearance of bias or, uh, or improper favor. <laughs> um, <laughs> are assistant coaches selling players to agents? Yes, absolutely. Same, same thing. You know, it happens. We saw with um, John Blake a few years ago. If it's not outright selling, it's certainly a murky area. He's getting paid by an agent. Players are signing with that agent. He's setting up meetings, etc. It makes you call into question whether his motives are pure.